Mark, if anything is true, it would seem that mathematics is true. Equations are, uh, seem to have a great deal of power in that equality. As a philosopher of mathematics, how do you address that question, why is mathematics true? If you, if you think about it as a normal person, a sentence like two plus two equals four seems obviously true. And I think most mathematicians would say that, and probably most philosophers. But in the philosophy of mathematics, one question we ask is, why are they true? What makes them true? And uh, there's really powerful arguments for thinking that mathematical claims like two plus two equals four are claims about abstract objects. And those are non-physical, non-mental things. And it's not obvious that they exist. Um, and so it seems like mathematics is only true if those objects really do exist. And so one view you might have that strikes me as at least plausible is that those objects don't exist, and if they don't, then math isn't true. So I guess the answer to your question is it's not so obvious that they really are true. And if they are, it's because these objects that exist in platonic heaven um, are there, and mathematics is a true description of them. Well, there are two views of the world, uh, Platonism and anti-Platonism or nominalism, uh, which takes uh, concepts like uh, I don't know, ideas of beauty and uh, of, uh, of, uh, of morality, on um, one hand, very general kinds of things, the nature of a cat, catness or tableness that characterizes all different kinds of tables or cats. Uh, but mathematics deals with numbers, mm -hmm. and numbers are also abstract objects. So let's just start from the beginning and saying, how is a number an abstract object, and is it the same kind of abstract object that um, tables and catness would be? Uh, are there categories of abstract objects of which mathematics is a particular part? Yeah, so I mean, by an abstract object, I mean, different people define it differently, but the sort of standard definition is objects that exist outside of space and time. They're non-physical, they're non-mental, and then- No causal relationships. They're non-causal. So there's various kinds of objects that people have thought were abstract objects, as you mentioned, properties like beauty, propositions, like things you can believe, and mathematical objects. So I would say that mathematical objects are one category within the broad category of abstract objects. Does it have any special characteristics within the broad category of abstract objects? I mean, they have the special characteristics of being mathematical objects, right? <laughs> like, so the numbers, right? Zero, one, two, three, um, they're just those things, right? But, know, so but, but they seem to be very specific. Like we know what three means. There are three things that could be any different kinds of things, whereas a, a concept like beauty or morality are very vague and kind of human defined things. So it seems to have some kind of difference. If there's vagueness about beauty, it's which property we pick out with the word beauty. Mm -hmm. if, if Platonism is true and the abstract objects exist, then properties are just as precise and perfect, perfect as mathematical objects. And the difference in vagueness is with us. We, when we do mathematics, are much more clear about which precise things we're talking about. Whereas in folk discourse, when we're using this word beauty, it's not always clear precisely which property we've got in mind. But that's our fault, not the fault of the platonic heaven. Exactly. Okay. All right. So we have mathematical <clears throat> objects being uh, uh, abstract objects in its, in, in, in its full richness like the other abstract objects. And so describe the uh, different views of abstract objects uh, and your analysis of it, the, whether they're real or whether they're not real, uh, what it means if they're not real, and then how, how that analysis of abstract objects in general would affect our understanding of mathematical objects. There's three views you could have. There's two main views. One, they exist. One, they don't exist. And, and that's called... Platonism or anti-Platonism yeah. or nominalism is the, another word. Yeah, for anti-Platonism. Right. There's a third view, which I actually am partial to, which is that some kind of non-factualist view that like there's something wrong with the question and there's no right answer about whether they exist or not. But those are basically the only views you could have about the objects themselves. Okay. But there's many other views you could have about mathematics, right? So one view is... Mathematics gives us theories about the nature of these abstract objects, like numbers and sets and functions. And 
our theories are true descriptions of those objects, just like biology is a true description of animals. That's Platonism. Um, but then within the anti-Platonist camp, people that don't believe in abstract objects, there's different views. One view is you're getting, the Platonists are getting wrong what mathematics is, even is. It's not a theory of abstract objects, it's something else. So those people might say math is true, but it's not a true description of abstract objects. My own view is that there are really powerful arguments against those kinds of views because there are really powerful, just empirical arguments about the language of mathematics that move us to think, no, these theories really are about abstract objects. And if that's right, if that argument about the language of math is right, then it looks like the only two real options are the Platonist view that our theories are true, descriptions of abstract objects, and the fictionalist view that while Platonists are right that mathematics is about abstract objects, the objects aren't there, and so the theories aren't literally true. They're still useful, we can use them in physics, but they're not literally true. So, so what, what is the practical distinction between useful and true? Or useful and not true in, in that uh, Practical? <laughs> I'm not sure there is a real practical difference. I mean, all of our, if the objects aren't there, all of our mathematical and physical theories would be literally untrue. But the fictionalist is, if, if, that, if it followed from that, that they're worthless and garbage, then of course that view would be unworkable. But the, the fictionalist is able, in my opinion, is able to account for why math and physics are sort of for all practical purposes true and why they're useful and why they seem obvious to us. And they can account for everything that needs to be accounted for. And then the difference between the two views comes down to a brute disagreement about the existence of these objects, which if they exist, we don't have any real access to it. And so there doesn't seem to me to be any practical difference. Like the mathematical objects could pop in and out of existence. And our theories would go from being literally true to for all practical purposes true. And we would go about our business without ever knowing the difference. But in the deep ontology of the world, <laughs> yeah. what would the difference mean? The difference would mean that it, the world would go from being a materialist world with just physical stuff to being a much richer world. And our theories would if, go from- if the, if the mathematical objects are real. If the mathematical objects are real, then reality is more than just physics. There's more than just physical stuff. It's also this abstract stuff. And so reality would be much richer. And because of that, our theories, which make reference to the abstract stuff would be true. But pragmatically, we would go about our business and everything. You'd never notice the difference, right? You'd pay your, you'd get your change. <laughs> we'd fly to the moon. Nothing would change. Right, right. But w w wouldn't it be a strange uh, organization of reality if all those things worked, the change, the moon flights, the, the uh, spacecraft being accelerated by Jupiter to make a pass to Uranus or wh whatever brilliant things are done. All that works and yet it, they're, all, they're all operating on non-real, non-really real, non -really real um, uh, objects. Yeah. That would be a weird, a weird coincidence, wouldn't it? it? It might seem like it would be weird. Like, wait, this is, you're telling me math is a fictional story Alice in Wonderland's a fictional story. That's not useful to physics. Why is physics based on this fictional story? But I think when you dig down, you realize it's not weird because when you look closely at the role that mathematics plays in empirical science, the role it plays is it's a descriptive aid. It helps us say what we want to say about reality. Um, but the math is because the objects are causally inert, they're not actually doing anything. It's not part of the story of how the world works. It's just an aid for us to go, here's how it works. And we appeal to these things to help us say what we want to say about reality. Be mostly because physical reality is like structured in a similar way. And so we, we use this descriptive aid to help us say stuff. But if the descriptive aid isn't really there, it still helped us say something. So here's an analogy. Let's say you say to me, what's your dad like? And I go, oh, he's just like Homer Simpson. And you go, yeah, but wait, that can't be true because Homer doesn't exist. He's a fictional character. What you said is literally false. And I go, oh, yeah, but my dad's like that anyway. <laughs> um, and so likewise, if you go, wait, how cold is it out? And I go, it's 20 degrees outside. And you go, well, that can't be literally true because there's no such thing as the number 20. Oh, right, but guess what? It's that cold anyway. 
You better wear a coat. <laughs>